Grab yourself a Sodi Pop and join me on my quest to find the fastest Pokemon in a Crystal Version Solo Challenge. Silver's box art legendary is up today, and I had really high hopes for this one, but it might surprise you that it really wasn't that simple. Lugia stats are as expected for a legendary, but the thing to look at here is that it's a bulky Pokemon, and you're going to find its high stats in defense and special defense, but 90 for the attacks, 110 speed, that's good enough. And the level up moves are honestly pretty bad. Your level 1 move is Aeroblast, which is really great. We'll get into that a little bit later. But every 10 levels you get a new move, and not a single one of them is going to matter to this run. But just know that at level 77, we're going to get Whirlwind, and that's when the run starts to really take off. As for TMs, the answer is yes. This thing gets virtually everything, and Pokemon like this are why I only put the relevant moves on my actual overlay. Now I ask you guys, what's the point of having 75 ant-sized font moves where nobody can read it, where 55 of them are useless, but that's another topic for another day. Here's the full list if you want to see it. The rival line today will be Cyndaquil, and let's be real, the rival rarely matters unless you are specifically weak to the three starter types, but let's go ahead and start talking about Aeroblast. At 100 base power with a high crit rate on top of getting stabbed, it's absurdly strong, but it has a pretty big drawback, and it only has 5 PP, and that's going to severely limit how much you can use it, and the opening section of the game was, it was a little puzzle to solve, if you really wanted to get like the time down as much as you could. Now remember that this isn't Gen 1 where it would crit every time, and in Gen 2 this move has a 25% chance to crit, which isn't that bad. Now originally I was picking up some extra early battles leading to Faulkner, but the flaw there is that more battles equals more time, so I did the bare minimum. Next up I did heal in Violet, and Faulkner has two gym trainers, and the fastest possible time that you can get was to crit two times on the three total Pokemon and have one Aeroblast left for Faulkner. Now to kind of like lift the curtain up and let you guys kind of see behind it real quick. Some runs need a little bit of luck. It's not really surprising because luck is just an inherent part of runs, but some Pokemon I will take low odds and just kind of start the run over and over just to kind of fish for some RNG if it takes place on the first gym and that's what we're going to be doing today. Now my goal overall for me personally isn't to have the most consistent run where I could like sit down and, and replicate a run 50 times with similar times but rather I want to get the fastest run and I think it's important to kind of shine a spotlight on this because sometimes I will take risk when it will significantly help a Pokemon out. After about four hard resets without getting two crits here I get the god luck here you're gonna see in the footage I'm gonna crit on all three Aeroblasts leading up to the gym battle I only needed two but I'll take it let's just hop into that first gym. With Aeroblast, I can do heavy damage to the Pidgey before I get to Struggle Strats, and with the Berry, there's almost no way to lose this fight. Now, it's really important to note, if you're wondering, that you can go into this fight with no PP left at all, you can use Struggle from the very start, and it's still very consistent, it's still a pretty easy win, it's just a little bit slower, and with this strategy, it just made for a very fast early game, and it gave me a Faulkner split that I was very happy with. Now I just, I can't sit here and act like the flying top is good. It's usually pretty bad in general, but Lugia really stands out and it feels like it takes full advantage of the Gen 2 mechanics. When you start off with a flying move and Aeroblast, and the very first gym is going to give you that flying top move badge boost, it means that you're going to really early, you're going to have a 168 effective power move at your disposal. Now the 5 PP is it's limiting, but if we're being real here, this is the only part of the game that it really holds you back a lot, and I think we just saw how I kind of offset that. Leaving Violet, I have to call attention to this Paralyzed Cure Berry. It's something that not every run needs, but for Lugia, it's one of the most pivotal items in the entire game, and it's going to come in clutch later in a bit. In Union Cave, we're going to be picking up Swift, and we're going to smooth over our small PP problems. This, along with Mud Slap from Faulkner, it gives us more variety, and it's going to bridge that gap to keep the run going fast. I keep things short, I keep things simple, we do the slowpoke well, and after the absolute bare minimum, we can just hop into Bugsy. 
And I just, guys, just look at Aeroblast. That right there, that's a 337 effective power freight train rumbling right towards these poor, unexpecting bugs. The only interesting thing about the fight I noticed in testing is that sometimes Bugsy would not send out Scyther second, but this one, it's about as easy as you would expect. After healing up, we can, I guess, take a look at Rival 2, but I just go straight Aeroblast once again. It's a swift victory, nothing to really talk about. In Alex Forest, I actually, I don't pick up Headbutt today. It is stronger than Swift, but think about this. Think about this for a second. Think about the time that you have to walk down there, the extra repel that I would have to use, the time that it takes to open the TM menu, learning the move. Now the critical thinking here is that if 10 extra base power is worth that time investment, and I just, I don't think it is. I run the usual errands and goldenrod, and the only thing that I would like to take a look at is this second battle in the underground. This man, he has three Magnemites and a Voltorb, and this right here, this one battle is gonna be the only real use for Mudslap in the entire run, but don't forget about the Magnemite line completely because Magnemite and Magneton, they caused me the biggest headaches in routing this run, and we're gonna, we're gonna come back to those later, so don't forget. So now I'm heading to the third gym. This run, it's been great. We expected no less. It's done the bare minimum without sacrificing any time. And let me talk about Scizor real quick. It's the current leader on my crystal leaderboard, and it's proven to be a really tough run to beat. Remember in that run, Rival number two had fire damage. I had to do an extra bit of training there. And then when we moved up to the fourth gym, Scizor needed to go do a little detour and get hidden power early. And then after that, it started to pick up steam with the eventual swords dance where it could just pretty much mow down everything. Now I say this, I want you guys to get in on my strategy early here. Here's my strategy for the run. I did four complete Lugia runs and I just could not catch the red steel menace. And I'm not trying to spoil anything, but that's just how it felt playing the run. Now my ultimate goal here was to get as big of a time advantage, as big of a lead as I could during the splits where Scizor had to do extra stuff. And we'll take a look at the numbers soon. Let's hop into Whitney, and to no surprise, the answer is Aeroblast. It's always Aeroblast. Clefairy's whatever, but let's take a look at the mill tank, and it's actually easier to beat if it goes straight rollout. That's my opinion anyway. If it goes for stomp and it starts to use milk drink, it makes this one slower. But you don't really need any extra levels, you don't really need the crits to win here, and that's why we're only level 17 in this run as opposed to something like maybe level 18 that I went for in early iterations of the route. But this one wasn't bad at all. We make it through it. Usually I would show split data here, but I'm gonna hold off because narratively I want to, I think it's more interesting in this specific case to do a couple more gems. We'll come back to it. But next I do take out the Kimono Girls and Surf is paramount to this run. It seems kind of obvious really if you think about it. Like Surf is good, who would have thought? But fun fact, I, about three years ago I did a video with Lugia and Pokemon Gold. It's no longer available so don't try to watch it. It was terrible and I forgot Surf was a move. To say it's important to the run is an understatement and since we are using Hidden Power Ice, it's going to be our only real answer to Steel Types and honestly Lugia really struggles against him for the most of the game. I would say it's the key weakness overall and if you didn't utilize Surf, you would almost assuredly have to go Hidden Power Ground just to be able to get by them and you would end up just taking the same detour that Scissor had to make. Looking at rival number three, I can just get the Haunter out of here. We don't have to worry about Curse, but let's highlight Steel Types once again. Notice I cannot one-shot the Magnemite, and it can go for a Thunder Wave if it wants to. Now luckily it doesn't here, and even if it did, I would still be able to win this fight, but when the fights start to get tougher, not being able to one-shot these things, getting paralyzed, it can be a huge problem, and it was a huge problem in practice. Now I'm just gonna sweep the rest of the fight, but when I was first learning this run, maybe if you like took the Haunter Lightly. Maybe you were trying to save PP on Aeroblast. You could get cursed. That could go straight into a Thunder Wave. Then you could get confused. And I actually reset here a couple of times. Now, we generally watch the optimized runs on the channel. We are here. It's going to look really clean here, but I have to let you guys, I have to cue you guys in on that stuff. Before we go to Morty, I want to talk about PP management. Get used to that word. And it, it made this run feel a little bit different. Now, to keep it real with you guys, Lugia without Aeroblast is not an elite Pokemon, in my opinion. It's still really good, but it does take it down just a notch when you can't use this move. I think most Crystal 
Crystal Runs, you can kind of just like turn your brain off and not worry about hard PP management too much. But little things like the two ethers found in Ilex Forest or the ether in Olivine Lighthouse were items that I routed in and made a point to use just to save time like you're gonna see here. And then later you have elixirs, max elixirs that were very helpful to keep our legendary at tip top performance. Because if you start to heal too much or if you're too stingy with Aeroblast, you're gonna start bleeding time and the run just wouldn't be able to compete. As for Morty, I just showed the Aether on Aeroblast and this is what it does. This is Aeroblast, everybody. Now, there's nothing to talk about in this battle, but to me, there's no worse feeling personally when you play a run and you find out that a Pokemon has a signature move, but it's really bad. Things like the Ekans line and Glare or Execute line with Barrage, they make me really sad. And you can just imagine how happy it makes me that Aeroblast is actually really good because I love signature moves, but that's another badge down. Afterwards, it's the bare minimum, and you already know it's time for a swift swim down to Cyanwood, and I think you know what time it is. Chuck, brother! I'm gonna say out of every single run I've ever done, under any circumstance, I couldn't imagine a more dominating matchup than this. I think the word overkill would sum this battle up really nicely, and this one's over in a blink of an eye. It's extremely quick. Now, my friends, it's finally time to bring up that split data and I held off because there's a little bit of a story that I want to tell. I mentioned the strategy to build as much of a lead as I could over Scizor and this is the results of my efforts. After the 5th gen, Lugia has compiled a massive 15 minute and 48 second lead and I picked the 5th gen because this is as high as that lead is going to get and I really want you guys to know that from this point on, Scizor has ultimately done all of the extra stuff in the entire run and it's going to start picking up up a lot of steam from this point on. Now we'll take a look at this again when we head into the Elite Four, but the narrative here is that Lugia cut every single corner that it could to take advantage of Scizor's longer Bugsy and Morty split. I also did something slightly unoptimal here that needed to be done, and I, I showed the split data over it, but I picked up return at a time that wasn't too efficient. Usually I would wait for the vitamin buy. Now this, along with hidden power ice, is gonna upgrade our learn set to handle pretty much every situation, but more importantly, return you already know how good return is it's so reliable and it's going to put a lot of the pressure off of pp management during the upcoming segments and speaking of segments i think you guys you know what i'm talking about Through the power of video editing, we don't have to take a look at a single rocket hideout battle, but instead, let's just pick it right back up at Price, and he's the ice top specialist and we're flying top. Now notice I don't even heal, and you might think that I'm saying all this stuff to kind of set up for a tragic loss, but I'm fine. The dugong even gets off some super effective damage, takes me into the yellow health. Now the problem here is the Piloswine knows Blizzard. It could knock us out, but the question is, will Price go for it? And the answer is no. He goes for Mist, he goes for a Hyper Potion, and I just kind of knock him and his little pig out while he's swirling in Mist. We can keep this one cruising. Now I gotta slow it down for a second because Jasmine's coming up and I have to touch on it. This fight was tough and it felt, at times it felt nearly impossible in a route slimmed down this much. And notice that now we have that paralyzed cure berry on. I messed around with this fight a lot from trying extra training to early rare candies to maybe trying to pick up the mystic water held item. And this was one of the very few points in the game that was a legitimate struggle. So I wanted to get some thoughts out before we just kind of dive into it. I think Jasmine in general is a gym leader that's tough, but often you'll see runs get hit power ground, or they'll just use Surf and one shot her Pokemon. But going for that top time and being defensively weighted means that I cannot one shot the Magnemites, and that means that it's gonna use Thunder Wave most of the time. I get extremely lucky here, and she misses Thunder Wave, and that's gonna save my berry, which ultimately means that I can use the berry when the next Magnemite uses it. But this fight was so carefully crafted to get by while paralyzed after avoiding the first Magnemite's Thunder Wave. I have kind of mixed feelings about it because I prep for this fight so much and then when you get to it I just get really lucky and it doesn't matter at all, but I'll take it. It is what it is. I think this was the second hardest fight in the game. 
And you guys, you all know what happens after you get seven badges. It's that dreaded phone call. It's going to warn us about the rocket takeover. They have level 17 Zubats. Nobody can do anything. It's a tragedy. And while we usually just skip over it because it's boring, I do want to take a look at one thing. I probably mentioned PP management way too much already, but look how beautifully the rocket takeover section went for me. How carefully planned out it was. I go down to exactly zero PP in all moves during the final battle in the basement part. I use an elixir and this makes it to where I don't have to heal or waste any time. Now outside of the Kanto as a whole, this right here, the rocket takeover, is the longest part of the entire game. And I think if you're just kind of like lackadaisically frolicking through it without much thought, maybe healing multiple times and you don't really have it planned out, I think this is one of the biggest time sinks in the run for a section that it's funny because we mostly skip over it, we don't talk about it, it's boring. But I think in general, this is about the most we'll ever talk about the rocket takeover. So if that's your favorite part, hey, this one's for you, buddy. For vitamins, I just pick up seven calciums, max out my special stat experience and that's going to take us straight into Claire. Two things of note that happened before this is that I got Never Melt Ice for ranges, and I also accrued two PP ups during the game. I used them on Air Blast, but the Dragon Airs, they're a one shot, not really worth going over. You know how it goes. I do Fat Finger a Hidden Power Ice and waste a few seconds on Kingdra, but things are progressing nicely, and that's eight Johto gems done and over with pretty quick. So right now, this is gonna be the first time in the game where Lugia is gonna go out of its way to do something extra where Scizor didn't have to do it, and that's gonna be the two extra rare candies. There's one in World Islands, there's another in Mount Mortar. Overall, they don't really take too much time, but they do take extra time nonetheless. I'm still not gonna pick up any extra battles heading into the league, so there's not really much to talk about. There is a lot to talk about, I kinda lied there. But inside Victory Road, I'm gonna be picking up Earthquake. It's a move that I skip often because it's generally just not needed, but guys, sit down, take a deep breath. I got some bad news to tell you. The hardest battle in this run was the Victory Road Rival. I got my hands clutched over my temples right now. I can't take it. What does the world come to? But this run, it necessitated that I replace Return with Earthquake. I know I have candies, but everything else in this run is pretty much so tightly planned that I would need to do extra battles to, to hit the levels that I want to hit. And I think overall this was the fastest approach, but let's just kind of dive in and let's show that final rifle battle. I'm not even gonna make a graphic or an intro because it's just so rare to see this fight be a problem and the Sneasel is no exception. I'm just gonna get it out of here. And the difficulties here is Magneton. It's the one huge problem. Now, taking the rival easy, not thinking about it much, not wanting to learn Earthquake, it caused me a lot of problems. Now, it's to the point to where I had a reset, multiple resets on some runs. Now, the main issue is that it's always gonna use Thunder Wave. And since he sends it out second, that means he has a full team behind it that will outspeed you, it's gonna confuse you, put curse on you, and it's not gonna be good. It's easy to lose this battle. It's hilarious that this is where my biggest hiccup in the entire run was, but you can see that it's gonna look fairly easy here because once again, we look at the optimized run. When Magneton is a guaranteed one shot, there's not much more to say, and it would be very easy for me to sit here and not even mention any of this stuff and just make it look like I played perfect all the time, but I think it's my duty to let you guys in on the process and give you like a thorough rundown of the Pokemon, but let's just, let's put the nightmare behind us. Now, believe it or not, I'm still not done. We're gonna flip over to the previous run. I guess some quick things to kind of take away here is that I'm about five minutes slower than the run that we've been watching, and that's pretty much exclusively due to not getting return for the rocket hideout or rocket takeover section. I have a reset from the rival fight, but my single biggest mistake in this run was holding off on rare candies. It made the Elite Four much slower, it made it even more riskier in some spots, and it slowed me down a good bit when I was already pretty much struggling to kind of hang in there with Scizor, but we can cut back to the actual footage, and I'm gonna use all seven rare candies up to this point to get up to level 50, and this will allow me to dominate the Elite Four, not slow down for even a second, and it was huge for the run, but let me kind of freeze frame here. We're gonna pause it, stop the tape, and I wanna talk about split data real quick. Now remember, I said that Chuck was the peak of our lead, and you see from 
Price to Jasmine to Claire to the start of the Elite Four, that Scizor is starting to make a comeback fast. What was once a near 16 minute runaway victory has nearly been cut in half. And I just want to reiterate once again that I had to be as clean and smooth and minimal as possible during the Johto badge segment because Scizor after that fifth gym is an absolute monster. It's coming for us fast, but without waiting any longer, I think it's time to fade to black. And let's just, let's start the Elite Four. And when I said the candies helped out a lot, I, I wasn't lying to you guys. Being level 50 here rather than level 43 means that I can just put it on cruise control, turn up the music and just travel down the highway without a single care in the world. This one's over quick. I do miss a time or two on the executor, but overall Hidden Power Ice puts in work and that's one down incredibly quick. Koga isn't quite as quick because you know, you know his shenanigans by now. Confused Ray, Toxic, Double Team, just annoying to be annoying. It's still not too bad. We're not in any danger of losing right now. And I guess now isn't the time to go over it. I'll just touch on it real quick. Having to learn Earthquake for that previous rival fight and get rid of return for the rest of the game, it's something that you did kind of have to adjust the run for. And I think we'll go over that during the Kanto section. And while this was a little bit slower, outside of the Crobat, there really wasn't too much wasted time. Just like we seen earlier with Chuck, we got the supreme top matchup here. I think it's really funny that the computer will choose to, you know, he'll send out Onyx second because it has Rock Slide and it thinks it's going to be doing good when I have Surf. But most of his teams are fighting top. I have Aeroblast. And we talked earlier about PP management. I did make sure Aeroblast, I had enough Aeroblast to one shot all the fighters with ease. That's the third one down already, guys. It's so quick. Like some of these Elite Four battles kind of fly by so quick that I feel like I need to kind of feel the air. But let's not. Bruno, he's done. Karen is up next. She has Ghost Tops dark tops you never know what could happen and i will say sadly that lugia will not be in the umbreon one shot club today but i can two shot it and you would hope that she would go for like a faint attack or something like that but she goes for sand attack and it connects it has me a little bit worried but i get one of those battles where it's really good i don't the accuracy doesn't cost me at all i just hit all my moves and we can pretty much just take everything out even though she might have the top advantage the secondary sub types of most of her pokemon just mean that things like surf or hidden power i can just do the job and just like that we're looking at the champion Gyarados is up first. I really don't have a direct answer for it. And generally, it's going to take two Aeroblasts to take out. And what happens most of the time is it'll set up Brain Dance, which is actually pretty helpful for us overall. But I just get the crit here, take it out, assert my dominance. And guys, you already know what's going to happen for the rest of this fight. We have Never Melt Ice on for those ranges. We have Surf for things like Aerodactyl and Charizard. And I just, I gotta say, guys, the night and day difference from using candies to not using candies was pretty crazy. What you just seen was one of the most clean elite fours you will ever see in any run. But if you didn't use candies, you could even, even on wheel, you could maybe miss a range, get confused, start to hurt yourself, waste a bunch of time. You could waste more time on Koga. You could very easily lose the Karen fight. But this one's over with. Let's not just drag it on any further. Very dominating performance. And just like that, Lugia has beaten the elite four. And you guys know what time it is. We're gonna go to Kanto. Usually we skip over everything really quick, but I do actually have a few things I wanna to touch on in Kanto. So let's not waste any time. Let's fade to black. Everybody just take a quick break. We'll resume in a few seconds and we'll get down to business. So going into Kanto, the first order of business is to reiterate that you can have a standard route that pretty much all Pokemon's gonna follow. Even with just return and surf, I could still one shot Surge's Pokemon. And there's really no need to deviate from the script, but I would like to share some change ups and some efficiency type things that I've been trying out as a whole. It all starts in Saffron, which is the center of the map. There's a lot of paths to go. And after I pick up Psychic for later, I immediately book it to Lavender Town. Now remember, Remember, as soon as you enter the town and the name pops up, the flight path is unlocked. I can fly back to Saffron and I can just continue. From there, I take out Sabrina, I go to Cerulean, which unlocks that flight path, and then I detour towards the power plant. And this next part is very critical because you're only going to heal a couple of times in Kanto. I'm going to heal at this Poke Center on Route 10. There's no flight path connected here, and once I do that, I'm going to talk to the guy to progress that Machine Park quest. Now it's back to Saffron, I'm going to back over to Celadon, I'm going to take out 
Erica, and then I'm going to fly back to Celadon and pick up the machine parts. Just like Generation 1, Nugget Bridge has a ton of trainers. I don't know if it's the single highest cluster. I doubt it because the rocket takeover exists. But just for the Kanto part of the game, this is the longest part. But at the end, after I talk to Misty, I can use teleport on Abra and I can go back to that Poke Center on Route 10 and I can complete the power plant section. And in all of my testing, this has been my favorite route to go. I do skip Misty for now. I talked about deviating, but I actually skipped Misty. We'll come back to that later. But when I head up to Pewter, notice how I just go up into the town until the name pops up and I immediately leave. Now never mind this annoying Beedrill spinner here, but the point of this is it saves a slight amount of walking. Now it's just a matter of cleaning up the gems and we can talk Misty now. Her gem is right next to the center so I don't mind holding off on it, but the reason I did for this run specifically was Perish Song on the Lapras. It wasn't a huge issue, I could still get by and I wasn't resetting a lot or anything like that, but just guaranteeing the one shots, getting some extra levels, it felt faster than risking getting to three on that parish counter and just having like an unnecessary reset kind of derail the run this late into it. As for blue, there was never really a doubt what was going to happen here. I don't quite have the damage to one shot everything, especially on Pidgeot here, but all it does on its turn is kind of display how pathetic its special attack is by hitting me back with Hidden Power Eye, super effective by the way, and I just I have all the answers for this fight. There's not really any extra detail needed, I don't have to bring out the microscope and look too close into this fight, but that's 16 badges down, and now we can kind of clean up the final touches. First, let me call attention to this. It really bothered me a lot that I was this close to a level up, but the goal for the playthrough was to get to level 63. I do have three candies left here at level 60, so I have to just let this go. I will bring up split data one final time, and once again, everything is turning up green on the splits for Lugia, and we still have a decent lead. And you might think that this one's a wrap, but hold on for a second, big guy. Take a step back. The Psychic Flying Legendary has a near eight minute lead after the Kanto split, but there's one one thing that worried me about this run, it's the fact that Scizor just went straight to red, dominated, but Lugia still has a few little things it has to do. I pick up the final candy, I use three, I get to level 63 like I just mentioned, and then I equip those leftovers, standard stuff. Now I'm going to be learning Psychic over Hidden Power, and next up, here are some more time sinks. First, I'm going to go to Blackthorn, and I'm going to use the Move Deleter to get rid of Surf, and then I'm going to go to the Golden Rod Game Corner, I'm going to buy 4,000 coins, and I'm going to finish up the Learn Set with Thunderbolt, and now I think that's going to put us at peak power. Flying back, things still look pretty great for Lugia, but remember, a reset or maybe like a slow fight on red would be pretty much all that it would take to kind of fumble the ball here, so there's, there's really nothing else to really talk about other than red, so I say it's time just to see how it goes. Number one up front is how necessary Earthquake is to one-shot Pikachu. At level 63, return, psychic, they cannot get the job done, and you do not want to take any super effective damage here, but Earthquake, it makes things really simple. One-shot it. Let's go to the next one. Blastoise with a Blizzard comes in next, and even with the seven Calciums, level 63, and Thunderbolt, the odds of getting a two-shot feels like a coin flip here. I even get pretty lucky. I get the Paralysis proc, but it survives those two hits and it connects with that 70% accurate blizzard, but if there's one thing that Lugia is pretty much the best at, it's tanking super effective special moves, so it doesn't really hurt that bad. Now from there, we're not out of the woods yet. You already know why. Because even though Espeon isn't threatening on its own, Reflect will make this fight anywhere from a slog to an actual losable fight. Now I think since I took some damage earlier from that blizzard, it was a blessing in disguise because it sort of inclined the AI to go for damage here, and that's perfect for me because we move on without the Snorlax having that huge defense boost. For Snorlax, you know that it's going to go for Amnesia on turn one, and since Aeroblast is just a pretty clean three shot anyway, that means usually it'll get off one body slam, and you just kind of hope it doesn't crit, and for once in my life, there's no crits, there's no paralysis, things go exactly how I plan them out. With the big beefer down for the count, victory is so close, I can 
I can taste it. It tastes like Wendy's ghost pepper ranch chicken sandwich, if you know what I'm talking about. Now Charizard's a clean two shot with Thunderbolt, and the worst case scenario is a crit or a burn, but I can take it out. And even if my attack got cut in half with a burn, I'm still fine because Venusaur, it's just sitting in the back, it's cowering, it's trying to hide. And for some reason here, I can't tell you why, I play it safe. I go for double psychic, and it kind of upsets me because I didn't end the run with an Aero Blast, but it is what it is, and this run is over. Lugia finishes the run with an end game time of 3 hours, 36 minutes, and 12 seconds, beating Scizor by over 6 minutes and staking its claim at the top. Just like the last few videos, I don't have tier cards or a concrete formula for rankings as of yet. I don't have enough data, but we're slowly getting there. This was a great run, but let me close out with this. When I did the Scizor video, a few comments kind of pointed out a couple of flaws in my routing, and I do think that Scizor could be improved at least a little bit, but since it's such a recent video, I don't think that it should leapfrog over runs that actually need it more, especially all those old times 4 speeds with different metrics. Just know that one day Scizor will be back to get its chance and get a redo. There are some improvements to be made, but for now, let's celebrate our new top Pokemon. Now let me ask you this, from my observations looking at different channels, it seems like Ursa Ring is likely the best Pokemon for a Gen 2 solo run. I don't need to go over the details here at the end of the video, but my final question question to you guys is if you think there's any Pokemon that I haven't played or no one's looked at that's actually like a sleeper hit that could be the best. I'm really enjoying playing Crystal. When I get to about 10 or so of these new metric times 3 speed runs under my belt, I think I'll get a tier list and finally get that formula figured out, but I do think that's about all that I have for you. Now if you've stuck around this long, you're a real one, I appreciate that, comment that down below. If you are new, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and let me give a big special shout out to my channel members and Patreons, the support means a lot, but now I guess it's on to the next video. I'll see you then, bye.